Konami's Crisis Force for the Famicom, released in 1991. Oh, and here's a quick trivia. This is one of the last ever Konami shmups ever to be made for this system. So the plot set in Tokyo 1990X, and what do you know, another case of Super Godzilla Clash of Demon Head Syndrome. A mysterious alien force, with roots tracing back to ten millenniums ago, wreaks all kinds of fucking havoc on all of civilization as we know it. As it turns out, this very alien force is composed of seven recently revived, impending monsters that once left the lost city of Atlantis and other ancient civilizations in ruins. They were once slain by a brave Mu warrior, and this is where our main protagonists come in. Enter two present-day high school student siblings with rather mundane lives, namely Asuka and Maya, whose dreams appear in the form of said chaotic occurrence, with a raging intent on saving all of mankind, and yet again thwarting the ever-loving shit out of those ancient extraterrestrial dildos via their futuristically constructed moon-inspired Aurowing battlecrafts. Must I mention, gameplay-wise, that this is a hell of a lot more than your typical shmup? In this precise case, a vertical scrolling shmup, no less. Similar to the usual Namco, Bandai's Galaxian and Galaga, Titus Phoenix and Halley's Comet, Halley Wars, what have you, Compile Xanek and Gunek, and even Alesti, Capcom's 1942, 43, 41, Double X, and even Legendary Wings, SNK Playmore's Alpha Mission games, Victakai's Imperium, Toll Plan and Taito's Tiger Heli, Thundercade, Twin Cobra, Truxton and Fire Shark, The Works. Except it's two player simultaneous. Life Force anyone? The customary correlation babbling aside, you're in total control of your Aurowing Battlecraft, trekking through the partly desecrated Tokyo, and even various ancient landscapes, underground and above, mowing down every bio-adversary in your way whilst enhancing said Battlecraft. Aside from your traditional 8-way navigation via your D-pad, B and A are managed, by default, in terms of firing your cannons, which start off weak yet adequate, and later dynamic and cutting edge, and making your vessel transform into one of three possible structures proportionately, and can be altered in the options screen beforehand. These structures are composed of front offense, side offense, and rear offense, the former of which appears by default, all of which focus the Aurowing's cannon projectiles in front, both left and right in sync with each other, and literally in the ass end, respectively. Special attacks, whether landing a specific type of bomb, creates a black hole, or an expanding six-tier pulsating halo of blasts, or quote-unquote telesplicing your ship in six, depending on the Aura Wing's form, can be pulled off by pushing B and A simultaneously. And take note, they can dwindle instantaneously. Bottom line, I strongly suggest saving these specials for the bosses, which will be discussed eventually. And while we're on the subject of enhancements, you can actually advance your weapons, bullet, and laser types by obtaining both blue and red orbs singularly up to level 4, and even bomb specials with B capsules, which are far and few between, surprisingly enough, from the collapse of certain enemies, as well as rocket-powered containers. Speedups are also a huge must, and may also appear as downgrades, which I strongly suggest avoiding like a quarantine, not to mention the combo capsules, represented by a blue orb with a red structure around it. Earn five of the latter item, and your Aura Wing transforms into a temporary, ultimate-as-fuck, Nazca-style combo-structured ship. Should you endure any damage before reaching said morphing stage nonetheless, your Aura Wing is downpowered each level depending on how many enhancements you've acquired to absolute shit all before it gets trashed. Getting back to the combo-structured ship, it can fire off more dynamic projectile weapons and unleash a more cutting-edge special, even with both your ships fused together if you're playing two players, in which case one of you pilots said ship while the other manages both the main and special offenses. In a true YY World 2 and Shatterhand fashion, both of which, yep, you guess it were out the same year, this form is accompanied by a time limit, which can be sustained by gathering more combo capsules regarding the former, or deducted every time you take damage in both cases. Even while you're confronting a boss at the end of each stage, those same rocket-powered containers randomly pop up, that is, in case your vessel happens to be in deep shit, whose chances turn out to be who knows how many to one. Thought I was gonna forget about the stage bosses? Consider yourselves mistaken. They include, but definitely aren't limited to, a nefarious biodroid with two loose hands, a resurrected mystic underground head, a gargantuan insect-like creature with two extending arms, a flammable attack craft, and even a rogue Egyptian-inspired flotilla of ships, to name a few amongst various lifeforms and artillery. All in all, the control aspects and gameplay procedures are nothing short of top-notch and unequivocal, minus the Gradius Syndrome, surpassing the shit out of even the likes of the aforementioned Gunak and Xanak, Irem's R-Type, and even Sabu Kayatsu's Raiden. In other words, HOLY FUCKING SHIT! I strongly recommend bringing my quintuple A-game along when it comes to intense shmups like Crisis Force. Anyways, all that aside, this is where the next familiar subject comes in. In terms of Crisis Force's challenge, regardless of which difficulty mode you've got set beforehand, I wouldn't even go oh so goddamn far as to expect a shit all milk run out of this one, or any hidden codes. Oh balls no! And before I forget, your score is indicated between stages in the style of the Contra franchise. 
In other words, it's never shown in game except after you defeat each boss, notwithstanding how pivotal said point count is for progression throughout. Hence, the replayability has decreased a smidgen. As I've stated in earlier examinations, Crisis Force, like most shmups, or better yet, all Konami greats, start out with what I like to call a no sweat path regarding the first three to four stages, but eventually, as you strive to conquer your itinerary one step at a time, it'll do way more, and I mean way more, than attempt you to crack your goddamn controller in half like a Twix bar if you're slipping up. It'll ram its iron tough fist right into your stomach and BREAK YOUR FUCKING SPINE! And even worse, deactivate both your mobile and landline surfaces to prevent you from making any potential emergency calls. Therefore, your senses and judgment have really gotta be on the ball, no matter how far you advance, let alone intend to do so. In your true greatest 3 fashion, the only way to see the true ending is if you've conquered this epic assault vertical shooter on either normal or hard, and you only get between 1 to 5 lives, altered at the option screen beforehand, and as ever, more of which are awarded to you depending on how many points you accrue, and 3 continues, which I highly propose managing to their fullest, as wisely as both your lives and bombs. And must I mention yet again that your vessel will get told to complete, as the Brits would say, sod all, after it's back to its initial state, except if you've enhanced its weaponry any higher. The graphical presentation is stellar beyond all means of belief, innovation, and imagination melded together. Aside from your main aura wing ships and its supporting weaponry which stand out twice as much as its opposing enemies, same story with the bosses. The bottom view background and foreground environmental factors are the tip of the old Titanic iceberg, especially the first stage where certain urban landscapes are decimated to shit all as your fighter craft approaches the middle area and is later split revealing an underground area in the style of the aforementioned Imperium. The collapse of natural and historical landscape portions in stages 2 and 6, the parallax scrolling in stages 3 and 7, I could go on for an incalculable, beyond fucking mathematics, eternity, and never get exhausted. Hell no. Shit, it's on the same level as other titles from that very same time period, including Shatterhand, Vice Project Doom, Ninja Gaiden 3, Wild Wild World 2, Samurai Pizza Cats, The Works, and even trumped the hell out of Ocean and LJN's respective libraries. I mean, if only they and their associated developers had at least close to the same capabilities. In terms of music and sound, composed by the indestructible trio of Kenichi Matsubara of Castlevania 2, YY World 2, The Lone Ranger, and Pop and Twimby Rainbow Bell Adventures fame, Yasi Komano of the infamous Contra Force aka Arkhound fame, as well as the sound effects designer for Turtles 2 the Arcade game, and Jun Chuma, also of the infamous Contra Force fame. This game's tunes are kilometers far from drab, and leaves but absolute complete jack shit to be desired. In other words, they're everything you'd expect out of a Konami game like you'd never imagined possible, and a whole lot more. Energetic, excessive, and eventful. And Crisis Force is no Jesus damn exception. While they're borrowed from other Konami games, the sound effects are anything but ear rapey and unnerving, notwithstanding how flat as a pancake they turn out to be after a tremendous deal of time. And here's my top 5, which I always look forward to when it comes to this game. Stages 1 and 6, Stages 2 and 5, Stage 3, Stage 7, and of course the boss theme. Replayability-wise, aside from the aforementioned semi-absent scoring system, the stellar's held presentation and soundtrack, and even the standard to advance degree of challenge in between levels, rivaling every fucking compile shmup, and even Naxxit's Osraka, released not long after on that very same system. And most importantly, if you're a hands-down, die-hard, no screwing around shmup addict like yours truly, consider yourself insane, no no, scratch that, preposterous as fuck to even contemplate passing up Konami's Crisis Force. Therefore, in Dauntless Summation, what's my final verdict on Crisis Force? Thanks in part to each and every impressive Beyond Expectation key component touched upon thus far, it's easy to see why this game never saw the light of day outside Japan, aside from its latest shit release. Henceforth, if you're on the hunt for yet another import gem that was initially obscured from us Westerners, I cannot recommend Crisis Force enough. By all means, track this down like the Cobra Lair in G.I. Joe. But be forewarned, you totally, totally need a converter for your NES, since it's a Famicom game. Also, at various online auctions, Crisis Force should run you about 15 to 80 bucks loose, or mind-blowing prices from 100 to 215 bucks boxed and or complete. I guarantee you, it'll make even Team Shanghai Alice's Toho Project look like a half-assed bastard child hybrid of Taito Space Invaders and Atari Centipede. Okay, maybe I went a bit too far, but seriously, give this game a shot or two. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God signing off!